question, please, whenever you, whenever you have a question, put it in the chat box and you're also, ready, you're also free to, to discuss during the Q&A. We'll have the three presentations, then the Q&A will come right at the end. So the first presentation is going to be on the elimination of cervical cancer. And uh, it's going to be on a policy perspective by Lillian Genga. You can see her screen there. She's going to give us a background on cervical cancer and what has been done within Kenya and even the advice from the WHO on what we need to be doing towards elimination of cervical cancer. Lillian, please uh, unmute yourself and let's just hear from you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lillian Genga, as Rosalind has said. I'm going to present um, elimination of cervical cancer and a screen and treat. Okay, so we'll start with the introduction. My screen has hung a bit, sorry, just in a minute. from the cervix and it is anatomically not visible to a woman. No woman can see the cervical cancer. Yeah, of course, it is caused by papilloma virus, in short HPV infection, which is sexually transmitted. HPV has many types. There's a high risk types, which are type uh, 16 and 18. They are the ones which cause cancer. Then the lifetime risk of acquiring HPV in sexually active women is 86% by the age of 50. So women with persistent HPV are at risk of cervical cancer. It takes 10 to 15 years for women with precancer lesion to develop cancer. And um, the precancer and early stages are symptomatic and symptoms indicate advanced stage. So I hope that one is a clear that at precancer and early stages, there are, no, there are no symptoms. But when you see symptoms, this indicates advanced stage. Please go to next slide. Cervical cancer. Sorry, please go to the next slide. It affects most uh, vulnerable women at their age of 35 to 49 years. Mm. And uh, cervical cancer with HIV, yeah, women living with HIV AIDS, cervical cancer occurs a decade earlier and it is more aggressive and they have six times more risk than HIV negative. And this is because of the, the low, low immunity. So causes, this causes uh, eventually um, emotional trauma, financial constraints, and um, also social impact. And uh, cervical cancer should not do this because it is preventable. So if we see a global burden of cancer, we see this is a new cases in 2020. We find that 
uh, the new cases were 19 million two hundred ninety two thousand seven hundred eighty nine, and uh, cervical cancer was uh, at three point one percent. That is globally. Yeah, but let's let's uh, go to the next slide. Then uh, global burden on cancer, cancer deaths. Uh, the estimated deaths in 2020 worldwide in both sexes, 9,000, 9,958,133. In deaths, actually, we are not seeing, uh, globally, we are not seeing cervical cancer, but let us move to the next slide and then we see our country, Kenya, what happens. So the burden in Kenya, that is cancer is the second leading cause of non-communicable deaths, diseases uh, deaths, and uh, the rising trend, trend is 14%. And this was between the year 2012 to 2020. So if we see um, uh, the, the, uh, or the first chart, we can see cervical cancer as the second one. It's the second leading and breast cancer is the first one. And then when we go to the deaths, we see cervical cancer now is, has taken the lead. So this is call to action that we really need to work on cervical cancer. And actually, the, the, the women cancers, that's the breast cancer and the cervical cancer, since we can see they are on the top. So let's move to the next slide, please. So globally, as we had seen, the incidence, we can see that um, the darker area, that shows you that where cervical cancer is still uh, having a lot of um, impact, and the lighter area, they have eased it out. So the darker area is the Africa. So in Africa, we are still at risk. Next slide. Again, when you go to mortality rates, previous slide, please. Mortality rate, the same thing happens. We find that death is high in Africa. And the other parts of the world, they have tried to eliminate it. So that is why we are working towards elimination. Next slide, please. So as we can see, the Kenyan burden of cervical cancer, that the, between the year 2012 and 2020, at 2012, the, the new the new cases were 3,286 and, the, and deaths 2,451. And when we went to 2018, it was now even higher. It went higher, it was 5,250 and deaths were 4,802. So we are not doing any better still when we see again uh, in the year 2020, now again, it's still like the same. No, no, it's, it's, there is no difference from 2018. That's uh, 5,000. I mean, the new cases were 5,236 and that's 311. So this, was, uh, this is a data from Globocan. It is showing that we are not doing good Next slide, please. So we have the policy context for cervical cancer elimination globally, WHO in 2018 call to action to eliminate cervical cancer and the strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer as a public health promotion problem was launched in November, 2020 and which is a 90-70-90 to target the targets to be met by 2030 for countries to be 
on the path towards cervical cancer elimination. So the first 90 means that girls to be fully vaccinated with the HPV vaccine by age of 15. 70% of women are screened with a high performance test by 35 and again by 45 years of age. The 90% of women identified with cervical disease receive treatment and 90% of them with precancer treated invasive cancer are managed. Next slide, please. Yes. Then we, when we look at um, globally, the the global the, the the global strategy of ninety percent of girls being fully vaccinated, seventy percent of women uh, being screened with high performance tests of HPV, and then ninety percent of those who are sick are also treated. We can see a picture there, and. Uh, this picture, the lady is the mother to the girl. And this lady is a cervical cancer survivor. And her daughter was the first to be vaccinated with HPV vaccine. So these people are champions. So let us work towards um, elimination of 90, 70, 90. And that is exactly what we are doing there. So Cervical Cancer Awareness Month comes in. The first, uh, the first anniversary of the launch of the strategy was marked across the world as the Cervical Cancer Elimination Day of Action in 2021. The National Cervical Cancer Awareness Month is celebrated in January every year. And uh, this, this will be the fourth year of int intensified cervical cancer advocacy and screening in the month of January. It is a platform for screening awareness of cervical cancer and the, import, the opportunities for its elimination as well as to intensify screening. This year, the, the commemoration will be launched in Kisumu County on 27th January. So we are still working towards 90, 70, 90. Next slide, please. So we have Kenyan policy framework that National Cancer Control Program has worked on. We have Kenya Cancer Policy 2019-2030. Then we have the National Cancer Control Strategy 2017-2022 the National Cancer Screening Guidelines 2018, National Cancer Treatment Protocols 2019. Um, we again have uh, the policy, we, we have a breast cancer action plan, uh, 20, 2020 to 2025. Then we have uh, palliative care policy document. All these are online and they can help us take care of our, our clients. Next slide, please. So National Cancer Control Program has strategic pillars. We have pillar one, which deals with prevention and early detection and screening. Then we have pillar two, which deals with diagnosis, registration, and surveillance. Then pillar three of treatment, palliative care, and survivorship. And pillar four, coordination, partnership, and financing. All these pillars start across pillar five, which is a, a pillar of M and E and research. Next slide, please. So implementing the National Cancer Screening Guidelines 2018. So one, uh, HPV testing is recommended as the primary screening method. 
other tests where HPV testing are not available, you could use visual inspection with acetic acid and cytology, which is pap and pap or pap smear. Then the target population women would be aged 25 to 49 years. Then screening interval is five years. That is how the guidelines states. Life course approach to cervical cancer prevention and control. Uh, we have prevention, primary prevention, where uh, nine to 14 years of age girls, in Kenya it's 10 years, are taken for vaccine, HPV vaccination. They should be given information and warnings about tobacco use, sexual education uh, tailored to the age and culture, condom promotion, provision of And then secondary prevention, women aged between 30 years of age and above, they should use, they, they should be screened and treat in single visit. That is, when you screen the woman, you find that there's a lesion, you deal with it on the spot. You don't send the woman to go back home and come back. And then point of care, rapid HPV testing for high risk HPV types, and then followed by immediate treatment, then on-site treatment, just what I explained. Then we have tertiary prevention for all women as, as needed, the treatment of invasive cancer at any age and palliative care, and then a, where we can have ablative surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and palliative care. Next slide, please. So the key points to remember, cervical cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths among Kenyan women. Cervical cancer is 100% preventable and global elimination targets 90, 70, 90. Please remember that. Life course approach to cervical cancer elimination need to implement the key components for comprehensive scale up of screen and treat towards elimination of cervical cancer, an organized screening program with targets, performance monitoring, and quality improvement structure is key. Next. So call to action, support the elimination of cervical cancer, be champions for vaccination, screening, and treatment, Avail organized screening services in your county health facilities through integration to, compl to complement opportunistic services. Offer health education to your clients, communities at every opportunity. Screen all eligible women and rescreen at appropriate intervals. Ensure proper follow up, linkage to care and appropriate referral. Do your part to ensure availability of commodities and supplies for screening. Involve and engage your community as agents for change. Next, please. So we come at stop cervical cancer. Stop means screen, treat, optimize diagnosis and referral, primary uh, prevention we, where we use vaccine and my presentation ends there and thank you for listening you can put questions on the chat thank you thank you very much Lilia for such a wonderful presentation we have been able to get a good start and we have realized that from the lifespan of somebody, all of us have something that you can be able to do, be it just uh, creating awareness and advocating for HPV vaccine up to uh, screening and treatment. 
So all of us, we have some tasks as you have been guided. Our next presenter is going to be Julie. Okay, welcome, Julie, You're taking us through the screen and preach approaches. Thank you very much, Rosalind. Indeed, thank you, Lillian, for the guidance on the policies. We have a lot of work to do. And so my role here is just to, to concentrate on the secondary prevention, which more or less is screening. Um, like, like Lillian has just said, we have a big task ahead of us. The number of cases being diagnosed every year are worrying over 600,000 and, and uh, globally, and yet half of those die. And that is the reason why we are having, uh, we are trying to eliminate cervical cancer because the numbers are very worrying. And yet cervical cancer is treated. It can be detected and treated completely 100% curable if diagnosed early. So let's start with the anatomy. Just a reminder of the anatomy of the reproductive system. Um, the cervix, which is where we're concentrating on today, is part of the uterus. It is the lowermost part of the uterus, which uh, comes into contact with the vagina. It has an internal and an, an external orifice. We call it an os. And this is our main area of uh, concentration. So between the internal and external orifice, we have the endocervix. And the external part where we see it on speculum exam is the ectocervix. So the endocervix is uh, like it says, it's situated at the center of the cervix and opens it to the vagina. And it appears pinkish or more or less reddish. And then the, it is lined with the simple columnar epithelium that secretes mucus. The ectocervix, which is the external part more or less, is uh, beyond the external os. It's, it's readily visible on speculum examination. It appears pink, actually pale pink, and it's lined with squamous epithelium. Just know there's a columnar epithelium in the endo, and the ecto is squamous epithelium. Now, where the squamous and the columnar epithelium meet, we have the squamocolumnar junction, a key area in our, in our cervical cancer uh, elimination process. So the squamocolumnar junction is the place where they, they both meet, and it appears as a sharp line of demarcation with a slight difference in height between the two kinds of epithelium. This diagram, uh, the diagram I'm uh, showing right now depicts a very good spermocolumnar junction where you can see there's a, a line between the, the ecto and the endocervix. So it usually changes with time, mainly because of the uterine growth or cervical enlargement and hormonal status of the, of the woman. So let's go to the screening methods. The, these are the three main ones. One is the HPV testing. Another one is a visual inspection with acetic acid or visual inspection with uh, lugose iodine. And there's, there's also the cytology or the pap smear. Number one is the HPV testing. HPV detection test is a test that uh, is very effective if used, very, uh, if used commonly. However, maybe we can start by saying HPV is the main cause of cervical cancer. 99.5.7% of the cervical cancers are caused by HPV. And 70% of these cases are caused by HPV type 16 to 18. Remember, human papilloma virus has many types. There are about over 100. 15 of them cause cervical cancer, but the main type is 16 and 18. So detection of HPV indicates presence of, of an HPV infection. And it may not necessarily uh, be that you have cervical cancer. It's just that you have HPV infection. And only persistent HPV infection with the specific high risk types may lead to precancerous lesions or even to the cancer itself. 
Um, when testing for the HPV, uh, we, we, the tests include uh, the DNA detection. There are two kinds of tests, the DNA detection and the mRNA detection test. So a positive HPV test indicates presence of at least one of the, the high risk uh, HPV types. And uh, fortunately, recently the tests are now able to identify both types, 16 and 18. And this has made the test more sensitive and more effective in identifying women with high risk or uh, the high risk of developing precancerous lesions. So with this, let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of the test. Number, the advantages, one is it, it, it does not require a high level uh, of technical expertise. Um, it also does not, and there's provision for self-sampling, self-sample collection. Uh, it has strong aspects of quality control, which is key in any test. It is more sensitive and more effective because it can identify the, the specific types of uh, viruses, and it allows for longer screening intervals. However, there are disadvantages. Uh, one is the huge, huge investment in equipment, uh, which may be needed, especially for the gene expert uh, tests. There's high cost, of course, with the, with the, with the investment in equipment, they, that means there's a cost implication. There is heavy dependence on reagents that are produced by one single manufacturer, and it, it requires a molecular diagnostic lab. There is low specificity in younger women. Women below 25 years, it might not capture them. And then the results are not provided in real time. That means if you don't get your results then, then, then we can't treat you. There's no screen and treat in HPV. Um, so how do you treat? Either, like I mentioned, the self-collection. The, the, the woman is given instructions on how to use the kit or a health provider, you go to a health facility and they can collect the sample for you. Now, what about the results? So when a woman has a high risk HPV negative, it's recommended that retesting is done in five years. That is if she's HIV negative. If she's HIV positive, then it's after two years. Whereas if the, the woman has a high risk HPV positive, we recommend further screening which includes either VIA or a VILI. We'll get to that soon. Or a corposcope. Corposcopy is where you use a, a micro, microscopic equipment to view the cervix. That means there is further screening required and if necessary, further management is advised. Now the diagram, the diagram I'm, I'm projecting right now is an algorithm for the HPV. Uh, this is available in the, the National Cancer Screening Guidelines, so someone can look at it. But it's good to know that with a HPV positive, uh, you can have a corposcope or you can have a viability test. Because not all institutions have a corposcopy available, then we, do, we go for the viability test if it's available or you refer accordingly. If it's negative, you rescreen after five years. So we don't necessarily have to do a cytology after a positive HPV. We just go straight to the screening, viability. Uh, now, what is viability? Like I said, via, via is via inspection, visual inspection with acetic acid. This is a method where you are detecting early cell changes in the cervix after applying a acetic acid. Acetic acid um, is 3 to 5%, remember? And, and it can burn if the percentage is not higher. So it's good to know it's 3 to 5%. And so you apply it on the cervix. There's a technique. And then you visualize the cervix after that. So uh, VIA is appropriate for women younger than 50 because they have the, the squamocolumnar junction visible. Squamoc SG, SCG, CJ is a transformational zone in other books. So for women below 50, the, the squamocolumnar junction is visible. So, and then again, it's recommended five years interval, but for VIA, every one year for the HIV positive women. HIV positive women, we've been told are six times more susceptible to get the HPV infection. So they have a higher risk of getting the HPV infection. 
Now, screening can also be done when they suspected HIV or uh, sexually transmitted infection. It can be done at any point during the menstrual cycle. This is a plus because any woman who works into a health institution should get a screen. And then the guidelines say that up to 20 weeks during pregnancy, so even the pregnant women can benefit and can be done uh, you know, without planning during a visit or any other condition. For example, like when you're coming for uh, family planning services, you can have a, a, a VIA done. So how does VIA work? It's an abnormal epithelial tissue. When the, the epithelial tissue is abnormal, it turns white. We call it acetyl-white reaction. So uh, this reaction is caused by coagulation of cellular proteins, which appear opaque. And uh, when, whenever the cells are HIV, HPV infected, they contain more proteins. That means the, the more proteins cause the opaque, and it causes them to be more opaque than surrounding normal tissues. And that is how we differentiate. So the, the proteins in the HPV are more than in the cells. Now, this is a diagram depicting how a via looks like. You can see the color changes in the transformational zone. The borders are, are distinct. The location, the lesion is located in the transformational zone, like I said, and the thickness, the lesion raised above the surrounding tissues. Those are the main characteristics. There are some via that will show you some different characteristics, and you, that means there's need for further testing if there's any uh, query in the via. So let's look at the advantages of the via inspection with acetic acid. Uh, one, it's simple and can be performed by a trained paramedic. It's inexpensive because all you need is the acetic acid. You don't need a lab to go to or a specimen to be collected. The results are available immediately, which is a good thing because if you, if you have abnormal results, you can be treated there and then. The, the, test, the test positive women may be treated immediately, like I said. Infrastructure requirements are minimal. Consumables are easily available. Uh, it does not require a lab, like I mentioned, and can be performed at any level of any health institution. Disadvantages. There is a, it's a subjective test, requires rigorous training and supervision. The sensitivity, sensitivity is lower than HPV tests, obviously. Specificity is low, it can, it can lead to overtreatment. Sensitivity is lower in postmenopausal women because they don't have a spermocolumnar junction that is visible. And, uh, and an ongoing quality control and quality assurance is needed. However, I can mention to the audience that this uh, test requires, uh, for a healthcare worker to say they are confidently screening, it requires a lot of experience. You cannot train today and say tomorrow you're doing perfect screening. You need a lot of uh, experience. You need to have screened several. So let's go to the visual inspection in logos iodine, VLI. So this is the same technique as VIA, but now you use Lugos iodine. VLI should only be done after a VLI should only be done after a VIA. So you use acetic acid first, then the Lugos iodine is more or less a cortest. It's more or less a confirmation of what is happening. And use of VIA alone is widely recommended as there is little difference in the sensitivity and specificity when combined. And the national guidelines recommend the continued use of both VIA and DILI as a coaches as the shift may affect quality of the results. So this is an, a diagram depicting the VLI positive. You can see the, the, the diagram shows where there is a dark ma mahogany on the cervix, and yet there is a banana yellow region. The transformational zone, banana yellow. So that means it's a positive. So the, the well-defined bright yellow iodine non uptake areas close to the earth of the columnar junctions is not seen or covering the entire cervix. Again, it requires a lot of practice. So the results interpretation, via VLE test is interpreted as positive if either of the tests is positive. 
And if the test is positive, treat as appropriate. For women who, who uh, get a viability negative, retest after five years, and the HIV positive, retest every year. Again, that's another algorithm for the VIA. All these are guidelines that uh, help us when, when we are screening and we are treating the, the clients. Um, I will skip this slide where who is uh, eligible for the test because I think it has been talked to about. And then this is a diagram show, depicting the VIA. On the left is the VIA, and on the light, right is the VLI of the same cervix, and it can just show how clear the, the, the abnormal region is. So let's go to the cytology of the pap smear test. So uh, this a perpendicular test is also known as a pap test or a pap smear. It involves exfoliating cells from the transformational zone of the cervix to enable examination of these cells microscopically. That means it involves labs and uh, collection of the samples. To, do, to examine for any precancerous lesions. So the cells can either be fixed on a slide at the facility or placed in a transport media. So there is either a pap smear or a liquid-based cytology and then sent to the lab for microscopic examination. If abnormal cells are seen on microscopic exam examination, the extent of the abnormality is classified using the Bethesda system. Now, uh, a pap smear is recommended as a primary screening method in the following situations. If a woman is not eligible for VIA, VILI, because their squamocolumnar junction is not visible, like I said, in the elderly women, and if the HPV screening is not accessible. As a primary test in women under 30 years, and there's also as a core test with HPV in HIV negative in HIV positive women where the resources are available. So limitations are also quite many. It requires specific specialized equipment and skilled health personnel. Uh, the results are not immediate. There's multiple visits to the healthcare facility because you come today for a test and then you are given a follow-up uh, date. Um, the lesions may be missed because of several reasons. For example, if the, the cells are not exfoliating or there's a barrier with the exfoliation, for example, if there's infection uh, or bleeding. And then cells may also not be sampled properly from the transformation zone. And uh, abnormal cells may not be transferred to the slide. Again, the technique really matters. And the tactician might miss the precancerous cells. Generally, it costs more than other screening methods, but not as expensive as a HPV test. Benefits are also there. It, it is trusted. It's proven over, over 50 years. It's, uh, it's given, adequate, given adequate resources and a screening program. It can be a practical, affordable, and accurate. The slides serve as a permanent record, yes. These are not discarded immediately. The pathologist can always review them. And there is no medical condition that could exclude patients from receiving appropriate screening, including pregnancy. And it has a high specificity and it's an appropriate screening method for women over 50 years of age. So let's go to recommendations. Who, can, who is recommended for screening as we conclude? Anyone who has had sexual intercourse is eligible for cervical cancer screening. The target population for screening, again, like Lillian has said, is 25 to 49 years, which is the reproductive age. Women 50 to 65 years are still at risk of cervical cancer, cervical cancer and can therefore receive screening every five years. Um, screening interval is five years among women who have tested negative for HIV and the HIV patient, uh, positive client, and other special groups are also recommended for annual screening. For, we have talked about the HIV positive or the immunosuppressed women who are, uh, they should begin cervical cancer screening at 25 years or what the first point of diagnosis. Screening should continue throughout their lifetime and screening frequency should be yearly if you use a VIA and a VILI, two years if it's 
if it is HPV testing, and uh, if it is also cytology, and yearly for cytology. Pregnant women screening can also continue until the first semester. And then uh, they should not be treated for precancerous lesions during pregnancy. This can be delayed until six weeks postpartum. And uh, for suspicious lesions, a biopsy can be done at any trimester by an obstetrician or a gynecologist. Uh, postpartum women, cervical cancer screening can commence six weeks after delivery. Screening should be continued in women who have received a total hysterectomy for benign causes with no history of gynecological malignancy. That means if you have a, had your uterus removed, then you can also continue screening. However, women who have received a subtotal hysterectomy with an intact cervix should continue to receive routine screening. Thank you. Let's remember that the cancer man, let's be aware, let's fight, let's support, and let's hope. Asante. Wow, that was very informative presentation. And we have learned the theory. I hope the majority of us are in practice. And those of us who want to join also, I know there are programs in, uh, in training regarding cancer screening. William can give us highlights on that towards the end. Thank you very much, Julie. Our next presenter is going to be, it's going to be Mr. Josea, as I had told you. And uh, the interesting thing is this is his um, area of expertise. He's a master trainer in uh, reproductive health. Josea, uh, please load your slides and start the sharing. Just say, are you able to load, or would you like us to load for you? We're not able to hear you or to see your place. for Josea to just uh, sort the internet connectivity problem, we can uh, have the questions and start answering them. Yeah. Josea, let us know when you're ready. So um, I'm going to go through the questions and Lillian and Julie, uh, you could answer. I hope Pamela Weri is also in the group. If she's around, she can also contribute into the answering. Okay, I had seen the first question and it is um, by Steven. The question uh, is that uh, what are the modalities of HPV transmission 
and the prevalence of HPV in Kenya. Uh, Julie, you could answer that. Lillian, you can also answer. Okay. According to 2021 data, 9% of women tested using HPV test turned out to be positive. So that is the prevalence. Come again, Lillian. I said the prevalence, according to 2021 data, 9% of women tested using HPV, HPV test turned out to be positive. And again, to answer on sexuality, yes, HPV is, sexual, is only sexually transmitted. Sex does not have to be you do, it does not have to be penetration, but sexual behaviors also, you can get HPV. Okay, I would also want to say, in addition, uh, HPV spreads through contact, skin to skin contact. So uh, there are some circumstances where we've had a transmission through mother to child, but of course it normally clears after a while. And so the only HPV that would give us a problem is the one that is not clearing after a repeated uh, treatment. Uh, another question is, uh, is Viavili still a valid screening method? Julie, you can take that. Thank you. Um, the question is screening, is screening by Vili. That means lo using logos, uh, uh, iodine, whether it's still valid. Um, According to our guidelines, uh, it is still valid after VIA. But uh, lately, there's results that have shown really doesn't make much difference. Uh, once you use VIA and you have uh, your a confirmatory uh, result, it is adequate. So it's still uh, I, I, a concern that is really still valid. Yes, it is valid according to our guidelines. But if with VIA alone, you are good to go. Um, there's another question. How feasible is treatment on the spot? Now, Josea was to talk about treatment. And, and uh, treatment means either, uh, it's treatment for the precancerous lesions. So when you're testing, for example, you do a VIA and you find it is positive, Treatment will depend on the size of the lesion. If the lesion is small, <coughs> then you can either do treatment using <clears throat> cryotherapy or thermoablation. If the treatment is bigger, then now you can think of either colonization or a uh, leap. Leap is what uh, it's called a loop electrosurgical excision procedure. So. I was hoping Josea would come in with the treatment part so that we can deal with it. I can see he's, uh, he's still trying to log in, but we can continue with the question. So treatment on the spot is also very feasible. Thank you, Julie, for that. And Josea is going to give us more information on the current treatment. And by this, within the scope of this um, webinar, we are talking about cancer screening, screening and treatment approaches. So we're going to be taken through the treatment in terms of screening. And that is coming in a short way once uh, Josea is ready to start off. Another question is that can we suggest vaccine for patients above age of 25 years old and have no history of sexual activity? Lillian, would you have an answer for that? Come again. Uh, There's a question that um, is asking if you can su suggest uh, the vaccine for patients above the age of 25 years old and have no history of sexual activity, like nuns, I suppose. 
the vaccine does not change provided the DNA test is done and prove that there's no HPV in the blood. So the vaccine mm. is the same. It's just the same vaccine that to give to the 15, the 10 year old girl. Oh, sorry. Okay, Julie, would you want to add on that? Yes, now the purpose of the vaccine, the target of the vaccine is the people who are precoitous, people who have never had sex. That means they have never been exposed to the virus. And that is why it was recommended for the age between nine to 14. And remember this vaccine uh, for the, that age of girls is free in Kenya. So the target was that population because we assume they have they are precoitous, they are not exposed. If you have never had sex, that means you have never been exposed to HPV and you are also eligible for the vaccine. Although the manufacturers say anybody can get a vaccine, uh, it's just that uh, it is better when you have not been exposed to the virus. That means before coitus. Um, there's another question on uh, vaccination of the boy child, the boys. Now, uh, in third world countries, okay, in first world countries, high income countries, the vaccine is given to the boys. But because mm -hmm. of course, the, the vaccine in our country is only given to the girls for free. If you want a child, to, a boy child to be vaccinated, they are still available, but at a cost. So the boy child is eligible. It's only that in our setting, it's, it's not uh, cost effective and the girl child is the target because she's the one who's going to be exposed to cervical cancer. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, Josea is about to start the presentation and I know that uh, all of us would want to have uh, uh, to eradicate cervical cancer. So I propose that at this juncture, we all go and look for the young girls around us, 10 to 15 years, and tell them we have this vaccine available in all public uh, facilities. And then we also go and talk to the parents of the boy child to consider giving them the private uh, vaccines in the, for those who are able. Otherwise, it's a, it would have been good to have it also for the boys, but we have to target the most at risk first. Rather, those who are exhibit the symptoms of the cervical cancer. Somebody is asking about the PowerPoint. Somebody is grateful for the good presentations. Thank you. We're also happy to have you. Are you the research department will guide if you'll be able to get the presentations. How can we get more of HPV kits? Kindly supply HPV tests to HPV kits to the testing sites. Lillian, I know MOH is working on this. Actually, according to the cancer screening guidelines, we had hoped that we will jump directly to the HPV uh, screening model, but uh, the economics involved in it. I know that uh, NCCP is working hard to avail the kits. Lillian, you are free to comment on uh, how you can be able to share with people in the facilities. And, and if just to target the healthcare workers possible. Um, like screening the healthcare workers. Well, I'm, I'm telling you that. No, somebody's asking you to, how can we get more of HPV kits in their facilities? And so I'm adding on to that, that uh, it would be a, an easier way to target the female uh, healthcare workers just to do the self-testing and bring the samples, the self-collection. So once you get and you supply to the facilities, also consider the female healthcare workers and, and let's have them do the self-collection and avail. I'm sure that can work for majority of us. Uh, Julie, case a question. A 53-year-old with menstrual periods advice. Um, thank you. I don't know whether this is in relation to, to cervical cancer, but uh, people who, some, I mean, menstrual, uh, menopause, 
sometimes it's early. They say the normal is from 45 to 55, but there are uh, people who are outliners. You'll find even a, a 55 year old still menstruating. So that unless they had stopped and started again, then, then, then that's the reason for worry. But if they are still menstruating normally, uh, I think that is normal. Thank you very much. And, and as Judith said, if the, pay, if the client uh, was still having the regular menses, then they need to go through the normal screening, as she advised us earlier. However, I've heard of uh, ladies and reports from those who conduct the support group that the women say, some of the women come and report that suddenly they've gotten their periods and they're very excited about it. So that one is a cause of concern because once somebody has reached into menopause, then they get... Uh, to have the menses again, it is a cause of alarm, and it's mm -hmm. a reason to come to the hospital quickly because you never know whether there's some cervical cancer setting in. So uh, we need to enlighten our population so that uh, they keep watch on, on bleeding again postmenopausal. Julie, this is yours. Is table vinegar recommended for cancer screening as acetic acid? And if yes, what's the percentage of vinegar in table of acetic in table vinegar? Now, acetic acid uh, is more or less the vinegar we use. But remember, there are different brands, different companies making vinegar. It would be important to know the percentage. And that's why I mentioned that. Uh, acetic acid should be three to five percent and not more and not less for quality control. So if you're using vinegar, please know the percentage of the acetic in it for purposes of quality. So in short, the reconstitution must be done professionally. Yes. Thank you very much. Up to there, we are going to allow Josea to take us to the last um, Phase of the presentation, and then we'll keep up. Uh, we'll keep uh, on with the. We'll carry on with the Q and A in the next uh, few minutes. Jessica, please take it up. See, I'm able to log in. Okay, uh, looks like uh, we'll keep on waiting for Josea. I've seen our um, professional uh, members. I've seen some nurses and uh, the gynecologists and obstetricians. Uh, Dr. Odur. Sorry, Dr. Odula and Professor Wanyoro, you are free to give in your contributions. Also, Pamela Were, you can also give into your contributions as you answer these questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Professor Wanyoro. Uh, thank you for that good presentation. I think, uh, as you have rightly said, uh, Kenya should be able to achieve elimination of cervical cancer by 2030, as the WHO uh, has, uh, has uh, uh, made that strategy. Of course, uh, this needs a lot of uh, strategizing. 
it needs a lot of uh, political will because of uh, resources will be needed. If you look at most of our facilities, we are still lacking uh, even in uh, simple things as what has been uh, uh, used before, that is the BIPD. So if we can be able to uh, get more resources, integrate uh, the strategy of elimination of uh, cervical cancer by 2030, uh, then I think we, we, we are and we, we should be able to eliminate uh, this uh, uh, disease because we know this is the only cancer that probably we can be able to get uh, uh, by screening uh, way before a person develops now the invasive cancer. And we having a vaccine for high risk uh, HPV uh, is also a plus. Thank you. Well, thank you, members. Thanks, Prof, for your comments. Uh, just to go back to someone who asked a question about a 53-year-old woman menstruating. Was the question about the woman having stopped her menses and restarted it? Or because it was a very vague question. So just to understand, was there a 53-year-old woman who had stopped her periods and started again? Because that would be the question. Thank you very much and well done. Continue doing these talks. Thank you. This is Odula, thank you. Thank you, Prof and Doc, for, for the contribution. We'll keep up with the, with the Q&A. And you're free to, to give your contributions along. Uh, this uh, comment that I would not recommend biopsy of the cervix during pregnancy because of the risk of severe bleeding. It might be prudent to wait till after delivery. That's our comment. My comment is that uh, probably uh, if if you suspect, if you do a speculum uh, in a woman and, uh, or, and you find that there is a lesion that is suggestive of cervical cancer, it will be better to uh, diagnose that. Uh, depending also on, because depending on where the woman is, you can start the treatment. So if it is very early pregnancy, then you can start the treatment immediately. Uh, and uh, because waiting, of course, then the disease will even move further. Uh, if it is late pregnancy, then you can wait until probably the, the baby reaches uh, at, at a time when the baby can survive outside the mother. Uh, then you can deliver that uh, baby and then you can start immediate treatment for the uh, uh, CA cervix. And of course, it all depends on the on the stage. So if it is early stage up to 2A, then you can do surgery uh, at the same time, maybe when you are doing a cesarean section. But if it is above 2A, then you can uh, do radio, uh, chemotherapy. Thank you, but there is no need to wait, especially if you do, as a mother comes to us and then you do, uh, she has the symptoms, maybe she has PV breathing, and when you do an examination, you find, uh, uh, you find an obvious mass, uh, which is suggestive of cervical cancer, it would be good to do an EUA and you do a biopsy. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Prof, for the input. Uh, there's another comment here that one of the barriers to screen and treat is poor uptake of screening services, which I believe is about 16%. Kindly comment on the status and measures to improve the situation by Dr. Ngore. Lilian, uh, could you just give us highlights on what NCCP is doing? to increase the uptake of screening? Okay. NCCP has, um, uh, at, at the moment, has already trained uh, uh, TOTs to train uh, others in the facilities in 25 counties. Actually, we've trained 1,000 nurses and uh, 300 doctors and we are still scaling it up 
to other 22 counties. We've already dealt with the 25 counties. So, and also we've trained the CHVs who are also going around to do the advocacy. So we believe that we will see the number going up, the screening number going up. Thank you. Lillian, I'm back. Eh? Yes. Hello, Lillian. I'm yes, back. I'm hearing you. Yes. Hello, is that just here speaking? Yes, yes, I'm back. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, Lillian, you talked of capacity building as one of the key areas. I'm sure that by celebrating the world, I mean, World Cancer Day that is coming in uh, in the few days time and celebrating all this Cancer Awareness Month, we're able to create more awareness and also demystify uh, about cancer. So that Actually, we are, encouraging, we are encouraging all the counties to do their screenings this month, a lot of screening and create awareness on cervical cancer, even as we mark the launch on 27th. Thank you. Jose, are you able to share your plates or you want us to share for you? Yes. Sorry. Yes. The heat. Yes. I, I will, yes, I will screen share. Hello. Yes. Sorry for the hitch. Hello. Kindly screen share if you have. Eh? I think I have a problem here. Roslyn. Roslyn, please. Roslyn, are you listening? Give us a minute. Yes, yes. Good. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. Am I audible? Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. So if you look at, at all people, uh, all uh, uh, you, uh, you went far. We want to look at the role of colposcopy. And the reason why we want to look at the role of colposcopy is when you look at all other tests, when it is positive, when your fire villa is positive, we will always say we want to do a colposcopy. We want to examine this cervix under a microscope. So, uh, sorry, you've gone too far. Come back, come back. Come back to the first one. The, the second one just has a H, uh, HBV, HBV uh, algorithm, just come back. So when you look at that, we want to say, we want to examine, uh, we want to have a colposcope. Whether, whether you are doing a VIA, whether you are doing a pap smear, we want to do a colposcope. So why do we want to do a colposcope? I'll continue, just go back. The, uh, you have gone too far. Rosalind, you've gone too far. We want to start from the first slide. Eh? That is the end of the presentation. But basically, as you, you are sorting out that, is when you, are, you have via villa positive, you have a pap smear which tells you high squamous in the epithelial. They tell you low squamous in the epithelial. 
or you have an HBV which is positive. You want to look at that cervix, and the only way you want to look at that cervix is you want to do a colposcope. You want to look at the cervix under magnification. You want to look at that cervix. If you are doing an HBV, and HBV says, yes, you have type 16 and 18, uh, um, they are positive for 16 and 18. That does not mean you have a lesion. What we are saying, you have an eye oncogenic virus in your cervix. So what do we want to do? We want to look at the cervix. So with a colposcope. And that is why we are saying, what is the role of colposcopy in cervical uh, precancer disease, uh, cancer? A positive diagnostic test reveals an abnormality or a disease. Advice about management is usually accepted by all women willingly. But when a woman receives a test, result, and it says positive, the expectations are fears that, uh, that she carries are different because many of them will think, fine, are we, uh, do we have the cancer in place? So it is very important that when you have those tests, you have a woman testing via VLI positive, HPV positive, or you are doing a smear and it says it is abnormal. It is good to tell the woman, yes, you have changes in your cervix, but it does not mean that you have cancer. Next. So the progression to precancer cancer is low. Everyone knows that. It's about 10 to 15 years before you get over cancer. And usually, think about it. Whenever we get women who have over cancer, they have already have cancer. What do we think? We miss the step. We remember we are in third world countries. We did not have vaccination. But what did we miss? We did, were not able to, one, screen these women. Two, those women who had abnormality, treat them. So WHO advises that women with high-grade lesions squamous in the epithelial lesion or cervical in the ablation grade two or more creator should be treated. Next slide. So current tests for subrecancer are neither completely sensitive or absolutely specific. For example, when you do an HPV test, it will pick cervical precancerous lesions, but also test positive for women who have innocent or transient high risk HPV test. That yes, what does it mean? That when you do that HPV test, that what the test can pick is one, it can pick the lesion to say, yes, it is truly highly oncogenic, or at times it is going to pick transient, that one which is going to disappear. Next slide. So what happens? Because already you have been told this woman is HPV 16 and 18 positive, but sometimes it is just transient infection. And I think that is why our guidelines are saying we do HPV for women above 30, because at that time we, they be, we will pick less false positive cytology. What happens to cyto cytology? Sometimes it can tell you borderline when the, uh, abnormality or tell you atypical asquema cells of undetermined significance. We know a number of this population, they might be big, but minority of them will transit to uh, uh, malignancy. So what do we do? The next slide. But about five uh, visual inspection about uh, with acetic acid. That one I've already said that most women in this would ask us, minority will proceed to have a malignancy. When you look at via, via with acetic acid, this first becoming a de facto screening method of choice in many regions where cytology and HBV is out of reach. But what is it? Go to the next slide. However, the specificity of bio is poor and the difficulty of missing and the endovical cervical lesions may occur. So at times we might look at the cervix. As one of the presenters have said, it needs some quite good experience. You go in and look at the cervix and you put your acetic acid, but you fail to realize that you already have an endocervical uh, lesion. And I think out of the the three things, and that is why we put it, say, in good centers or well-established centers with infrastructure, these women should be subjected to colposcopy. Next slide. 
Start screening via cytology and uh, are imperfect. And women with abnormal primary screening tests need further consideration. And the consideration is colposcopy. So there are several scenarios where trials might be useful in the management of uh, pre-cancer, and that is very important. Local circumstances. What is your circumstances? You want to talk about a colposcope, but you do not have even reagents to screen. What is the, uh, your local scenario? Do you have a colposcope? That is the first thing. Do you have the manpower? The cost, what is the cost of that colposcopy? You want to do colposcopy, but what is the cost? Can the client afford? Availability of the test facilities. And finally, the expertise will play a role in determining which primary tool is used and which secondary or tri tri uh, test is important. That you are in an area, you are in, a, uh, you are in an health center, and you are seeing women who have via positive. You have a thermo ablator, you have a cryo there. You've seen the lesion is small, you can do it. You can send that woman to higher center for colposcopy because you have the expertise. But what happens in those areas like KNH, where I work in a crew level five, where you have a colposcope, you would want to subject those people to colposcopy. So colposcopy is usually a low powered microscope and light immunogen examination of the low genital tract epithelium. It was fast. Uh, reported use was in 1920 as a result of collaboration between uh, one university, University of Ebenbach, and the German uh, microscope manufacturer, Leeds. Next slide. So that is typically how it looks. That is how a um, uh, colposcope looks like. Next slide. That is the instrument tray. Next slide. I will not be labor so much on this, but you need only a kidney tray, bottles of normal saline, 5% acetic acid, glucose iodine, molten solution, bottle containing formalin, local anesthetic syringe, jar containing alcohol for subphygol smear fixation, dissect all that. Let's move to the next slide. So what is colposcope used for? Colposcope is used to examine any epithelial surface of the genital tract. It's also used to examine the vulva, the anus, the vagina, and more recently, the oropharynx, as well as any penile epithelium. Because of these sites are prone to developing colposcopically uh, recognizable precancerous lesions. Next. However, the greatest majority of colposcopic examination are of the cervix with suspected breast cancer. Very important, the performance of a colposcopy is purely a diagnostic tool. So why, what is it used for? You want to examine the cervix when you look at, you have a suspicious looking cervix. When you have symptoms suggestive of cervical cancer, e.g. persistent postcoital bleeding, persistent in Jesea, Jesea, are you there? Jesea? Looks like he's dropped off. Jesea? Jesse, are you muted? I think you are muted. Unmute. Thank 
Okay, Josea, you are free to join us, but meanwhile, we will be heading towards uh, winding up. And I see there's a question on, uh, is there a chance of potential future development of cervical cancer if the virus are present, but it is negative? What is the danger? Okay, the question is, uh, is there a possibility of getting cervical cancer if somebody is HPV negative, if I may try to understand. Uh, um, hmm. Lillian, you can answer. Professor Wanyoro, you can also answer. The let's go to all, all our let's questions are around the vaccine. Josea, we're going to give you the shortest time possible to give us yes. highlights of cryotherapy on lip yes. and summary colposcopy. Yes. So you have around five minutes, five to seven minutes just yes, to wind yes. up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Close. Okay. So you can just post up uh, the, 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 the presentation. So what, when you want to do a colposcopic examination, the first thing is you want to assess the state of the cervix at the time of examination. So when you want to look at that, you want to assess the hormonal uh, status. Is the epithelial mole sterilized? Are there any pregnancy state? in women who are postmenopausal, what is the degree of atrophic epithelial? Next one. Next slide. Next slide, kind of. So on that, you want to look at the cervix, determine whether there is inflammation, because you are looking using a microscope, whether there is viral, Confirm full visibility of the entire cervix and upper vagina under colposcopic review. Determine whether there is evidence of previous treatment or any degree of epithelial uh, fibrosis. That is very important. Remember, patients with hard lip will come back after one year and want to look at it using, uh, by, by, via colposcopy. You want to determine the size and type of the transformation zone. Is it, what is the type? Is it type one, is it type two? What is it, is it big or is it small? Next, let's move on. The next slide. Recognize epithelial abnormality. Are there any disease? And if there is any disease, is it CIN1? Is it low squamous in the epithelial? Is it high, high squamous in the epithelial lesion or carcinoma in C2? Next, the fourth one, what do we want to do? The fourth one, the fourth one is you've already realized that one. So what do you want to do? The fourth thing you want to do, are you going to take a biopsy? Are you going to offer treatment? What is the greatest? That is a very important thing that you want to take a video or a number of pictures for examining uh, of the findings as to record what is the type and size of the abnormality. And finally, you want to do a combined a with Sweden score. So, and you document the above findings in a standard and audible, uh, something which you can audit in an audible format. Move, just keep the images, move on. People love to look at that when we share. That is a colposcopic uh, image. That is when you look at the cervix using colposcopy. Very important, you can stop there. You can see when you do, this lady was HPV positive, uh, human papilloma virus positive. When you look at under colposcopic, you see you have some, it's already, you have a CII grade cervical in the epithelial lesion. Move to the next one. Just leave the images. Fine, move the images. The next one. What are the, some of the, this is a confirmatory test. Colposcopy is a confirmatory test. What can be the errors? You can have errors like inadequate training and experience, inadequate understanding of natural history of the disease. Very important, the third one, when you fail to use established diagnostic protocol or deviation from the protocol, um, pick up failure to use the appropriate biopsy sites and failure to take enough biopsies, very important that you're looking at the cervix and you're seeing up normal areas and you fail to take appropriate uh, sites, failure to take a biopsy when in doubt, or when you use a plant, next slide, when you use a plant uh, punch biopsy to obtain. Very important, I'll move to, yes, if you have a cervical 
second to the last bulleted. Remember, you can do uh, your colposcope and you have an endocervical lesion. You fail to take an endocervical curative when the lesion limit is not seen. That makes the diagnostic tool not to perform well. Next. Finally, you, when you fail to communicate with your pathologist, very important, because we want to look at this in a multidisciplinary approach. You want to communicate with your pathologist so that you can see what are the results. We've been doing colposcopy and picking up tissues. What are the results? Is it consistent? Because if you are taking, you have eye seal, for example, and you are taking your biopsy, and the results comes and says, chronic cervicitis, what is wrong? Would it be there a problem with the cytologist or you are taking the wrong the, uh, area? So what are the treatment options? You've looked at the cervix, you've confirmed your diagnosis, you want to look at the treatment options. So treatment methods are actual, for actual or suspected, CIN should be effective and safe. Effective treatment implies a recovery, removing all of the transformation zone, very important that when you want to give treatment, you need to remove the entire transformation zone. So you can remove the tra entire transformation zone on two methods. One, you can have excisional methods where you want to look large excision of the transformation zone, or two, you want to do what we call, uh, you want to destroy the transformation zone by either using it, or you want to use a gas that is freezing to minus 20 degrees, so at the outset, the patient should be counseled about the need for treatment, the risk of the procedure, and the risk of not treating the lesion, as well as follow-up. Studies have shown that women who have been treated with certain like ablative methods, cryotherapy, come back 10 years later with a lesion. What was the problem? We did not follow up these women as required by the guidelines. So the decision to treat should not be automatic and should be then depend exclusively on the result of an individual screening test or the diagnostic uh, test, but to take into account individual case characteristics, women with HIV should be given a priority. So relevant case uh, characteristics include parity pre previous treatment, fertility expression, but very importantly is the likelihood to, to, to for the de default. If you are doing an outreach, you are seeing 100 or 200 women in a screening camp, and you have those women who are via positive, what is the likelihood of them defaulting treatment? So it is important when we are looking at that, doing mass screening to give an option of treatment. So treatment should have com uh, accomplished complete detection of transformation zone. I think I have already said whether the TC is being excised or the destroyed ablation should be above should be about about seven millimeters. That is that because deepest gland grip can contain CIN can be as low as seven millimeters as far as Anderson at lay 90, 80, and destroying up to seven millimeters gives sufficient degree. So what are the methods I've already said? Let's move to the next one. What we, we want to look at cryotherapy. The next one should be cryotherapy. So cryotherapy was popular in the U.S. during 1970. So it's also known as cryo-ottery, cryo-surgery, or other people say, next slide, or people say, just cryo. When this equipment is available and cars, supplies are insured, and when the preconditions are met, it is reasonable choice of therapy. It has few serious complications, and uh, it can be performed by nearly all not nearly all the clinical officers, nurses, and doctors can, have, can, can do it. So cryotherapy castings are large and heavy, 10 to 15, and thus it's difficult to transport. They require refilling relatively frequently at a clinical level. Uh, so finally, cryotherapy takes longer. It takes about 15 minutes to start to, fin to finish the thermal ablation. What are the conditions you want to use? You want to use when the DC uh, for destructive uh, treatment. This is both for cryo and uh, thermal ablation. First, you must visualize the transformation zone, either whether it is type one or type two. Very important that you must visualize. The DC must be small enough to be covered by the destructive me method probe. So when you are putting the probe there, it should cover the entire lesion plus 
a part of the normal uh, part of the normal epithelium invasive disease must be ruled out so when you look at it and you see this is a suspicious uh, lesion you should not if you have a fungating mass you do not do cryotherapy if you suspect you have an endocervical lesion you do when there should be no disparity between cytology and colposcopy very important sometimes you do cytology and cytology tells you carcinoma in situ you do uh, your colposcope and you cut out uh, or they tell you this is hcl in 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 in, in, in pap smear when you do diagnostic uh, colposcopy plus punch biopsy you realize it is low that is how the tongue looks like the cryo tip you can look at the cryo tip the shaft the trick where you're going to pull so that it's going to release the cast the also simply the tongue you have the valve these are the uh, cryo uh, tops you want to do so what do we want to achieve you want to destroy that epithelium by freezing it down to less than minus 20 degrees a metal probe is held in contact with the uh, transformation epithelium so calcia, the gas is let out to escape so what happens when you have the cars there you have cellular necrosis and uh, crystallization and subsequent cell membrane rupture the probe must be appropriate in size and shape for the relevant transformation so if the method is used so what are the steps i think that is you will read in the notes you have to cancel and get an informed uh, consent you have need to add specular put the patient in uh, lithotomy you have to have, but very important is nine and ten. So what do you want to do? You want to freeze for three minutes, and then you thaw for five minutes. Five minutes means you, you do not freeze, you just hold on, and then you do another freezing for three minutes and remove the prop after towing. The, the next one. Next slide. Next slide. Before that one, there is another one. I, I wish people to participate here to look at before that one, before that one, the first one, where you see, so that is a, yes, that is how you want to place the cryo during treatment, should be in contact. And then you can follow the next one. The next one is you will see the, uh, the, the area where the ice ball has been formed, even outside, the, you can look at here, you can see the ice ball outside here. And then the last one, that is how the cervix looks immediately after cryosurgery. Next one. So one of the biggest disadvantage about thermal ablation and cryo uh, uh, surgery is we do not have tissues for, cyto uh, for histological examination. We do not have tissues. So on the other hand, thermococulation is where you want to eat the, uh, the probe is heated and it reaches about 100 to 120 degrees. Duncan, I, that was by a study by Duncan in 1983. This was first called, called uh, was named called calculation to discriminated from radical diatomy, which reaches 300 degrees. So with thermal calculation, the intracellular water uh, reaches boiling boils and the cells necrose, and you achieve this tissue destruction between four to seven millimeters as per that study in 1998. So thermal calculation is very equivalent uh, as equivalent success rate to cryosurgery. It is quicker to perform with low complication rates and does not require refrigerated gas. It takes less than two minutes to complete and is usually done without anesthesia. Finally, although energy is produced electrically, newer thermal coagulation units are battery operated and can provide subsequent, uh, you can use it. So the therapeutic, uh, therapeutic temperature is 100, which is not enough high to produce cheering or smoke, therefore, avoiding any unpleasant order for the patient and the doctor. So you do not need a suction machine like when you are doing a large excision of the transformation zone. So subsequently pregnancy and others are going to, this lady is going to get pregnant because we are just removing the epithelia. It is what I've already said that both of them cryo and thermal ablation do not offer tissue for pathological examination. So those are the steps in thermal ablation 
people will love a, uh, just move on, people love a look at that uh, in their own time on the sharedness. But very important on the red is that if the transformation zone is larger than the thermal calculation profit, you can apply for further 45 to the untreated area overlapping the previous, previous treatment. That is a disadvantage. When you look at cryo, we only do single treatment. But when in thermal ablation, what will happen is when you see small, small, uh, you do one lesion and you see another small abnormal area, you can use, you can give the treatment. Next slide. So those are the types of uh, thermal ablators. That is a WISA one. We have cold co uh, coagulator. The next one is liquor thermal coagulator. Next. So the next one, we have already talked about the two methods where you are going to destroy the tissue. The other one is the large excision of the transformation zone, let's or leave. It was coined in the 1980s to describe early excision of the transformation zone. You want to use electricity to cut part of the cervix, which is abnormal. So you are going to use electricity. And this discovery was done by Varaday that, uh, that muscle do not contract when contracted by alternating current. So you use monopolar diatomyl or electrosurgery is used using LEDs. And then you have the electrosurgical unit there. So you have power going back. Since electrical energy is concentrated in the small area where you use the loop, so it's unlikely that you're going to cause shock or any other trouble. So continue the next one. So most machines will have the blend type where you have the cutting and the calculation where you achieve cutting and calculation at the same time. So after clear and adequate counseling and informed consent, ask the patient to lie in the coach with necessary equipment and the attendant and your appropriately. Uh, so for this one, you are going to use anesthesia. And like when you are you, you doing because of time, we are going to use local anesthesia when you are doing local um, excision of the transformation zone. Just move on. Yes, sir, you have one more minute. The next one. Yes, go to the diagrams. Go to the last one where we have the diagrams. Two diagrams. So the importance of when you excise that part of the cervix, you have two things which are very important. One, you are going to remove the lesion. The next thing is the pathologist is going to have time to look at that lesion. And when they look at that, correctly there. So you, you see, when they do, this is, you've used your loop, you've cut out this, uh, the abnormal area. What will happen when, go to the next one, when you would go for histological examination, first, the pathologist is going to study the ages and and the pathologist is going to tell you, did you excise the lesion completely or you've left part of the lesion inside? Secondly, they are going to give you the histological type correctly. Here, now the pathologist is going to look at these ages. Return back, return back, just like for, for 30 seconds, add me one minute. Yes, this one. The pathologist is going to look at this age. When they look at this age, they are going to say, did you excise the lesion completely? Or do you have other part of the lesion remaining behind? That is very key. And then they are going to look at this tissue completely and say, are we, what is the type? In this scenario, you have two sets. You've excised the first part, and then you do a second ex Thank you very much, Josea, for that presentation. I'm sure we'll be able to share these notes on the Kenyatta National Hospital website, where we can just catch up with what, what else you may not have uh, gone through in that particular part bit. And also we can have another session in due course. 
So I'll, I'll ask the participants, uh, Lillian and Julie, if you are with us, kindly just give us your parting shot. Focus on HPV because I've seen the questions are around HPV. There are many others, but I'm sorry, we may not be able to tackle. And Professor Wanyoro and Dr. Dula, you're also free to give in your inputs uh, if you have any. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Professor Wanyoro. Maybe I can uh, uh, say that was a very good talk. So there was a question on whether you can get uh, cervical cancer uh, uh, when you don't have HPV. So what I wanted to say is that what has been found is that uh, over 95% of cervical cancer is as a result of uh, infection with the high risk HPV. However, mm -hmm. and over 90% of cervical cancer is basically squamous cell, and this is the one that has been attributed to HPV. We have a few more cancers. Uh, the other one, uh, which, which is uh, formed about 10% of cervical cancer is adenocarcinoma, which is basically arising from the upper part of the cervix. Uh, from the, uh, uh, the, the, the gradular cells. This is rare, but up to 10%. We have very rare cervical cancers, which includes a combination of uh, adenosquamous carcinoma. We also have others like uh, lymphomas. We can also have sarcomas and the uh, other tissues like uh, uh, the neuro uh, endocrine type of cancers, which are very rare. These are the ones that probably may not be associated with the uh, HPV, but we know that a majority of patients that we will see have squamous cell carcinoma, 90% and above, and these are purely uh, associated with the high-risk HPV. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, insight. Uh, this is Dr. Dula. I can just say that um, as uh, people in a clinical setting, just let's normalize specifically asking the question about uh, whether a woman has had a pap smear or even at the point of insertion of an IUD early pregnancy, just put a simple speculum and you'll be able to learn a lot about the majority of our women just by the look of a speculum and refer accordingly. Do not miss an opportunity to look at our women's services. That can really be the point of care that we can be starting with. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Julie, you have something to give us as a packing shot? Yes, uh, in summary, I'd like to say that the WHO launched uh, a strategy on uh, accelerating elimination of cervical cancer. That strategy has been mentioned in this uh, webinar, but I'd like to emphasize that the 90-70-90 is a very good strategy and um, we need to embrace it and maybe even uh, uh, work with it as it is. The first 90, remember, says vaccination. So vaccinate 90% of the girls who are between 9 and 14 years of age, or at least by the age of 15. So let's uh, give education to the guardians, to the parents out there that they need, we need to vaccinate our girls to prevent uh, HPV pre infection. The second one was the 70% screening. Screen all women. So encourage women, uh, educate them on uh, screening importance and uh, using the high performance uh, tests for screening, at least by the age of 30, and again, by the age of 45. And the last strategy was treatment. So treatment of any precancerous lesions or cancer itself early and in time. So by 90% of the women who have the lesions should be treated. And uh, if they have cancer, let, the, let them be managed accordingly. So this strategy is very useful if it is uh, implemented. So that is my some parting shot. Let's vaccinate, let's screen, and let's treat accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Lillian, you are a final one. 
Yeah, I will just repeat just what Julia said. Let us screen, 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 and also do prevention by vaccinating the girls. And all this, when you do, you do, you, you do them, please record. When you don't record anything, you don't key in data, then you've not done anything. It's only the data that will show us that we are eliminating cervical cancer from our country. So I am encouraging us to screen. And after that, please let us record. We vaccinate, let us record. We treat, let us record so that this go into data. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you too. Hello. Uh, Rosalind? Yes. Rosalind? Yes. Final shot. Yes, just Yes, as, as Lynn and I said, we need to document, but another important thing, we need to do our data review. Let's be reviewing our data so that we see where we are doing good and where we are doing wrong, so that we can build on the capacity. Our test quality assurance, I think, will be very important on that part. Thank you. Sorry for the inconvenience of internet. Thank you. Thank you, Josea. Uh, I'm very grateful that you all managed to stay up to this particular point. Uh, special thanks to the presenters, the panelists, and also to Professor Wanyoro and Dr. Dula for being with us and just uh, uh, chipping in, contributing to the, to the webinar. Uh, I would like to say that as my part, parting shot, in addition to all those, we need to take any opportunity that we get to create awareness. We need to see how to, to work with the other clinics that uh, deal with the ladies. We need, we need to ensure that we take any opportunity that comes along, be it uh, in the antenatal clinics, as we have been told, be it uh, in our churches, when, when we go and we get opportunity to talk about uh, cervical cancer, let's press awareness and let's press awareness of both uh, screening and uh, vaccination. Thank you very much for listening to us. We are grateful that you have been with us up to now. We are also inviting you to join in the evening for the, the next webinar on the topic, as you can see on the screen. Thank you again for listening and staying along. Thanks, Kenneth, for hosting us.